I saw a guy with a t-shirt the other day at Sam's or Costco, one of the two. And he had this writing on his t-shirt. And it says, the church has left the building. I got to thinking about that. And I think about, and I've, I've studied, called it churchology. In modern times, 21st century. I know a little bit about why some churches are doing what they're doing. And interestingly, the, the, it was a local church that this guy had on his shirt from the St. Louis area. But when you look this phrase up, the church has left the building, and you do an image search on Google, what you're going to see is that a lot of churches are using this same theme. Which tells me something. It tells me that they bought it. This church bought this stuff from a company who put it out. See, that much I know. All these churches, these what I call these coffee shop churches. Because that's really what they are. It's a big coffee shop where they have like a life coach giving you three things that you can do to make yourself like yourself better. I'm going to give you seven reasons why you shouldn't like yourself very much. Okay? But I, I know where they get these ideas and where they get these sermons from. They're bought and paid for. There are companies in this country who market themes and whole sermons to churches and the preachers of those churches buy them, including buying the sermon outlines and the sayings that go with it, I guess so they don't have to read the Bible that week. Now, I know this for a fact because I caught a guy that I know doing it. He was a guy that I went to Bible college and, with, and when I went to Bible college with him, he was a clown, and I mean he was a Romeo, girl-loving-on clown. Good-looking guy, Mr. Athletic, that never took anything serious in his life, and all of a sudden I find out he's pastoring one of the largest and fastest-growing churches in the Tulsa area. And I'm going, how did he get... I knew him. It didn't make sense. Somebody went to his church. I didn't know this. They went, visited his church. I'd never said anything about him. And they, they said they visited his church. And they, it's one of those churches that gives you the sermon outline on paper and you fill in the blanks. So they had the sermon outline there on paper. And they mailed it to me. And they said, Pastor, we went to visit this church. And Pastor so-and-so was the pastor. And I'm going, yeah. And I'm reading the outline. And I went, I, the guy's first name is Toby. I said, Toby did not write this. I know Toby did not write this. I wonder where this came from. So I looked it up. And I got a result from Google Books. They had a copy of... Joel Osteen's book, Your Best Life Now. And in the book was this statement. If you, Brian, I'm going to, add the, I'm going to write in the word Brian. If Brian will change his thoughts, God will change his life. And that was on that paper, word for word. So when I, what, I, what Google would show me of that part of the book, I looked at that part of the book and I looked at Toby's sermon outline and I went, he wrote down word for word what was in this book. And I went, that's Toby. That's him. Now, their churches have these prepackaged themes with nice logos, nice graphics, 
they sell the music for the band to play to go with it, or they will suggest hip-hop or rock songs for the church to play to go with it. And then the pastor will get up with the pre-written sermon, with the outline already there, and maybe little verse references here and there, and they sell these to churches, make millions of dollars, and churches buy these things quarterly. They buy the music, they buy the sermons, they buy the graphics and the right to use them, the right to republish the sermon outline, even on the screen or put it on paper. They have to buy a license to print the sermon outline because it doesn't belong to the preacher, it belongs to the company. And they do this stuff. If you look, if you see some church with some logo, go look it up. Or some little saying, go look it up. I guarantee you some, some company's selling that stuff. That's why you see, if you do a Google search, some of you at home, I know you're doing it. The church has left the building. You're going to see all different kinds of churches using that same thing. They all bought it. Or some of them stole it. That's probably what I would have done back in the day. But anyway. But where did they get this idea from? The idea comes from, the, it's, it's this idea, and, and, and a pastor that I know did something like this in a church that he started. He came to me and said, Brother Michael, I'm going to start a church just north of here. And he said, I, I would like your blessing. And I knew what kind of church he was going to start. And he said, no, I don't, I don't want to take any way any of your people. And I knew what kind of church he was going to start. And I'm going, don't worry, you ain't going to take my people. I guarantee you that. And so they made the paper one Sunday. Because one Sunday, they said, we're not going to be in the church building. We're going to be outside of the building. And so they, they took a Sunday. They spent a whole month doing this. One Sunday, they repainted stuff at the city park. Instead of going to church. Another Sunday... They mowed some people's grass. Another Sunday they did this. Another Sunday they did that. They got wrote up in the paper over this. And let me tell you, I have a sneaky suspicion that we're turning the gospel into what you do versus what you believe. And who knows what the gospel is? Or you think, you know, raise your hand. The gospel is not what you do. Because that doesn't count. Works of righteousness alone are as filthy rags in God's sight. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of, lest any man should boast. And the whole idea about this, the church has left the building, is... They're bragging about what they left the church building to go do. Look at us. Look at what we are doing versus the, what they call the dead church sitting in the pews believing. And let me tell you from experience and from the Bible, I would rather have a church full of people that believed what God said. Does that mean you don't got to do nothing? Somebody came to me this morning. They said, I'm seeking out God's will. I said, well, I hate to tell you this, but you're in it. You're in it. And God did it in you or it wouldn't have happened. Now, can we pray more? Can we read more the Bible? Have you ever had spells where you didn't do much of either? And then... Did God bring you out of that spell? So guess whose idea it was? Guess who did it in you? Because let me finish that verse. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. That's what the Bible says. And the gospel will forever be about what we believe and never about what 
we do, no matter how good intentioned it is, it'll never be that. Somebody say amen. Now, to me, and believe it or not, there's even churches that are marketing themselves often as the naked church. The naked church. Now, what they may, what they may be selling to you does not match scripture. Because number one, that in itself brings to my mind lasciviousness. Don't ask me what pictures came up in my mind. But number two, there is a church in the Bible that Christ himself said was naked. Who was it? It's the church of the Laodicean. He said, thou, thou art miserable, poor, blind, wretched, and naked. And Jesus did not say anything good about the Laodicean church. And I believe that's what we're dealing with right now. But it's all over the place, I found out. Church, talking about churches left the building, churches left the building. And I read an article this morning. The article title was, we know that if we look in the Bible at the word church, the church is never a building. Now that's what it said. And I knew that the title itself was misleading because it wants to convince people that God does not have a dwelling place among men. Now I want you to think about what I just said. If you look at every occasion of the word church in the Bible, even in the King James, you will not see that it's related to a building. But let me give you some other terms that are in the Bible. House of God. House of the Lord. The Lord's house. Those are in your Bible. And I believe that if God burnt this place down, if lightning struck this place and it burnt down, we still are the house of God. But the house of God gathers themselves. Do you believe that? Say amen. Or else why did you come? Because too many people out there say... Well, I'm just as good a Christian as all those people sitting in all them churches. Now, believe it or not, they might be in some cases. But that doesn't make the statement true that I can be a better Christian than anybody inside a church building. That statement is not true. In fact, where is it in Hebrews Help me out. This verse, for some reason, I didn't have it in my notes. So I'm going to ask you where it is. In Hebrews? Hebrews what? 10? Hebrews 10 what verse? 25? I can't even find Hebrews in my Bible. Hebrews 10, 25. Open your Bible up and turn there. And I'll put this verse up on the screen. Now... I don't know if this is going to end up being a series, but I, God reminded me of a man by the name of Hezekiah. And I'm going to show you something about what Hezekiah did here in a minute. Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Now, it's right in that it doesn't have to be a church building. But since we have one, this is the place to come to. I was here... When they dedicated this building for a specific purpose, 19 October in 1974, they dedicated this building and this sanctuary for the use of preaching the gospel, praying, leading lost people to Jesus, and helping saints to live their life till they go to heaven. And then have their, I believe you ought to have your funeral here. Amen. That's how I am. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as, as the manner of some is. That's those people. 
But exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Can you not see the day approaching? Are you not to exhort? Do you not come here to be exhorted? I came here a mess today. A mess, an emotional mess. And I knew that I just needed to be around God's people. Somebody came to me this morning. God told them to. And sort of helped me out of it. I needed that. And isn't that why you're here? To either give it or receive it. Now, I see we got some visitors here. How y'all doing? Has anybody said anything mean to you? Okay. You girls doing okay? Right after church, I'll go get a pocket full of candy and I'll give y'all something, all right? Oh, you should have seen them. They went. Amen. Where y'all from? Hillsboro. I'm sorry. I live in Hillsboro, so I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, they came here, I guess, to either be a blessing or receive one. And I want you to think about who brought you here. Turn to 2 Chronicles 29 and give me some time to preach, can you? I didn't sing songs this morning because I wanted to preach. I wanted to set all this up for you. Again, I, this, I, I may preach a series on this. I don't know yet. But God reminded me about a man by the name of Hezekiah and what he did. Hezekiah was... I want you to listen to me now. Hezekiah was one of those guys in the Bible that did most everything right. But he's like us. He didn't do everything right. But did God bless him? You look at what the Bible says. Hezekiah, when he began to reign, he was 5 and 20 years old and he reigned 9 and 20 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And look at verse 2. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Now, the Bible says that about a few kings, but most of them, it says he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And you could always tell the difference. But when you look at Hezekiah's life, he obviously didn't do everything right. God got ticked off at him. And by the way, Hezekiah was the guy that was going to die. And he was afraid and he asked God to extend his life. And remember, the clock went back. And that was his sign, so God gave him more years. Do you know what he did in those years? He gave birth to a man by the name of Manasseh, who was probably the most wicked, evil king that Judah ever had. Had he died, Manasseh would have never been there. So maybe you living longer is not necessarily the way to go. But he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. And watch this, in the first year... In the first year of his reign, what did, what did he do? In the first month, what did he do? Open the doors of what? The house of the Lord and repaired them. I want you to ponder this for a minute. Let's pray. Father, I need your help to preach. My mind's running all over the place. There's too many rabbits. Help me to stay the way you want me to stay. Help me to say what you want me to say. Help me to preach what you want me to preach. Thank you, God, for delivering me and helping me. And I need your help today. Because I realize, God, you could have shut the doors. But you didn't. And help us to realize, God, that these doors need to stay open. The door to your house. Help us realize who does that, why he does it, and what it's for. So, Father, I have no idea how to preach this. I don't have the words. So, Father, you lay it out and you do it because you'll do it better than me. Speak to somebody's heart today is what I ask. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Look at your Bible. He's, he becomes king. He's only 25 years old. And I would say that he's got it together a whole lot better than I had it when I was 25. But he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David his father had done. 
And in the first year of his reign, the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And I want you to think about what this means. The house of the Lord was the temple of God. And God had, had Solomon build a house. So don't give me this nonsense that God's not in a house somewhere. Don't give me that talk. Don't give me this garbage about, we're leaving the church. We are still the church. Don't give me that nonsense. God builds houses. Amen? He's built one in us. But I know for a fact, I cannot do this alone. I'm not designed to. And neither are you. If God made us part of the body of Christ, the, my whole body's connected. You should have heard what my granddaughter said the other day. She saw a man that was missing an arm. And this particular granddaughter says things not just out loud, but very out loud. And she said, Mommy, where's that man's arm? His hand fell off. And she's just going, would you shut up? I didn't show up here to get my arm. It's been with me the whole time. Understand that, amen? And I just, I want you to get this idea in your mind. I, I'm probably going to mess this whole sermon up. But Hezekiah is a picture of God opening up his house. Because somebody closed it. That's later on in the notes. But somebody closed it up. And I want you to ask the question. If you were... It, what kind of state would you be in if you decided you were going to close the doors to the house of God and never go again? Ask yourself what state, what condition you would be in if that's the case. You, if you decided, I am never going to another church in my life, why would you do that? What condition would you be in? Help me out. Not good? Why, John? You need fellowship? Is that all we do here? Sit around and talk? Always one. I was looking for one of my granddaughters. I'm going, which one said that? What else you get here? The Word of God. Get washed. This is a house of prayer. People come here to pray. I suggest if you are going to pick a day of fast and pray, come here and do it. I'll shut down the whole internet for you. No cable TV anywhere. You just come here and fast and pray all day. That's all there is to do inside this room. That's all there is in here. What spiritual condition would a person have to be to shut the doors of the house of God? Now think about what Governor Gavin Newsom did in the state of California. What has he done? He shut the doors of the house of the Lord. Why did he do Why did he pick that? Now remember, this is the guy who's letting everybody in Los Angeles, San Francisco, all these other cities across California get together and protest peacefully where they basically get together and they, they turn it into a mosh pit is what they do. There's dancing and partying going on, people taking drugs, people getting drunk, people rioting, trying to burn down, trying to take down monuments. And nobody's concerned about that. Oh, that's not going to spread COVID. But if they come to God's house and I don't want them to sing either. That's what he said. And then Justice Roberts twice now has turned his back on conservatives in this country and voted against church meetings. Twice he's done that. Man's an abomination to this nation. It is the fundamental right that was guaranteed in our Constitution that, that Congress shall pass no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion or establishing a state religion. So what kind of mindset would a person have to have? But let me, let's, let's go up a, le a level in authority. 
Gavin Newsom and apparently some of the judges in California think that they have a right to stop people from going to church. But ultimately, ultimately, who is it that controls all the doors, whether they are opened or shut? Turn to Revelation 3. Underline this in your Bible. By the way, this applies also to whether your Bible is open or shut. Can you read your Bible while it's shut? Revelation 3, 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, and he that is true, and he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth. Now let's stop right here for a minute. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And if Jesus wants the Bible open and read in this country, then no man can shut the Bible in this country. Say amen. No man can do that. They can pass all the stupid laws and all the judges can make all their stupid decisions about what they think is best on a, on a, uh, on a virus that at best is not as bad as the H1N1 flu years ago during Obama. And nobody shut nothing down. But apparently Jesus has, uh, has determined that there are some people in this country that he's shutting the doors to the house of God to. Now you ponder that for a minute. Who's the best judge of mankind's character? Is it man or is it God? God. And if Jesus has determined that some people, they're just going to have the doors to the house of God shut he shut them. Who shut the door of the ark? The Bible makes that very clear. God, the Lord, shut them in. Who was on the inside? Noah and his family. Was it possible then for somebody who came up after that and knocked on the door? Noah, can you let me in? Noah said, I can't let you in. I didn't shut the door. You had your chance. And now the door is shut and it stays that way. So in California, Illinois, Missouri, even in Missouri, I mean, yeah, we spent two weeks where I thought, you know, maybe we ought to play it safe. I don't know what this virus is. We're going to play it safe for a couple weeks. But after two weeks, I got on the phone and started calling people. I said, you know, if you want to come, you're more than welcome to. I called, remember Sister Betty, I called you. Betty, if you're ready to come now, you just let me know. When you're ready, you can come because I'm letting people back in. I didn't wait for the governor. God laid it on my heart. We opened back up. But even in the state of Missouri, their churches still closed. Or they're so choked down that nobody can get in. Maybe they'll let 10 people in. Maybe they'll let 20 people in. But other than that, they're not letting anybody in. And apparently, God has seen fit to shut the door on those people. Those, some of those churches, they abandoned the Word of God years ago. So you know what that meant? God closed the book on them years ago. They're like those people in Isaiah 29 where they said they took the, the book that was sealed to the man that could read and said, can you read this book? I'm sorry, it's sealed. I cannot open it. That's how it works. And I want you to ask yourself this question. Are you ever afraid? Have you ever been in fear that God would judge you one day and he would say, I'm closing the book on them. And I'm closing the doors to the house of God on them. I'm going to shut them. Because I'm tired of their foolishness. I'm tired of their nonsense. I'm tired of the hypocrisy. I'm tired of their sin. And I'm not going to take it anymore. And I'm going to shut them out. I have. 
He that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and he and shutteth and no man openeth. He did not say doors. He did not say books. He did not say eyes. He leaves it open to let us know and understand that if it's open, God opened it. If it's shut, God shut it. At, right after this, in Revelation 3, you go from Revelation 3 to Revelation 9, and you see the, the angel. There's an angel that opens up the bottomless pit. Who gave him the key? Who had the key? It's right here in Revelation 3. He has the key. Who gave it to him? I guess the Lord did. And he let out devils that God has held in prison now for thousands of years. But God's going to let them out to judge the people in this world. He's the one that opens and no man shuts. Psalm 122, look at this verse. What is it about the house of the Lord? I, I put John on the spot. Let me read the scriptures. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I want you to ask yourself about your attitude come Sunday. Sunday rolls around. Hey, get up. It's time to go to church. I don't want to go to church. I don't feel like going today. I'm sick. Now, yeah, sometimes sickness, you probably shouldn't go. But in my years, I've seen people that somehow Monday they were all better. And I'm talking about consistently. Not just one Sunday. Monday they were all better and at Walmart. But come Sunday, they're sick. Come Wednesday night, they're sick. Sunday night, they're sick. I guess God just gives some people an attitude to where when they say, hey, it's time to go to church, they say, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Going to church, it's not some boring thing to me. It's not some big hard thing that I make myself do. I just want to be there. Look at Genesis 28, 16. What is the house of God? Jacob awaked out of, his play, out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. And this is the what? Gate of heaven. And I'm here to tell you, those who want to go to heaven will want to come to God's house. Somebody say amen. Because let me tell you what heaven is. Church. It's an eternal church service. Lindsay, I don't know if you heard I mentioned. You heard it? All right. I won't say what granddaughter it was, but she belonged to Lindsay. <laughs> This is the gate of heaven. This place, coming to church, gathering together, assembling with us, even online. This is why you people online, you freak me out sometimes. Y'all ain't real. I guess God works special in your life, and maybe God would work in my life that way. Because you folks online, you're, you're there every time. They discipline themselves to where on Sunday morning they turn off uh, the news and the cartoons and they turn on Bethel Church and they sit and have church in their homes with us and they do it Sunday night, Sunday morning, Wednesday night, PMO time, watchman time, homecoming time. We got people, can't somebody beg me? So they sent me a message. You know who you are. Pastor Mike, please tell me you're going to broadcast the homecoming. I can't be there. Of course we are. We don't have closed door meetings here. Amen. But this is the gate of heaven. And do I come here because I have to? No. But I know where the gate of heaven is. And by the way, what did he call the place? Look it. 
And, and Jacob rose up early in the morning. He took the stone that he had put for his pillows, set it up for a pillar, poured oil upon the top of it, and he called the name of that place what? Bethel. Bethel. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Psalm 23, verse 6. What is the house of God? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell where? In the house of the Lord forever. See, that's what, that's what Gavin Newsom, and that's what even some church people, I guess some pastors don't realize and recognize. That coming in the place that God has set aside for us to come into. And Sterling, he's our elder deacon. We look to him for wisdom. Sterling, you think we ought to shut the doors down and just everybody have home church here? Think we ought to close the doors and keep everybody out and just sit at home? Or do you think we ought to have people come here to church? Our elder told us what to do. That man's got wisdom. I mean, he sat out for a couple weeks. They didn't know what this virus was. But then they started coming back. It's best to gather in God's house. Because surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. And you might as well set your heart. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 27, look at there, turn that over there, turn over. Psalm 27, three pages, boom, you're there. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell where? All the days, look what he said, all the days of my life, not just up there, but here. Either God puts it in your heart, and you want to do it, or he doesn't. And then you've got to ask the question, why isn't it there? I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire. Look at what he said, inquire in his temple. Somebody just right after the service last Sunday asked me a question. I was able to give them an answer, but here I am reading them out of the scriptures. God laid that scripture on my heart to read out to everybody today. We're going to trust in God. If it all hits the fan, we're going to trust God. Because what do we have left? I mean, who's got a year's worth of ark supplies laid up? Who's got... Well, I shouldn't ask. I would say, who's got enough ammunition to fight off? Because I know a couple people that do. <laughs> but other than that, we'll just have to trust God. Amen? How about this? Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 10. And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them. For the Levites and the singers that did work were, were fled everyone to his field. Then I contended, then contended I with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I, what did he do? I gathered them together and set them in their place. You know what the, you know what the house of God is for? Number one, it's not to be forsaken. But number two, get ready for this one. Believe it or not, because every now and then you get out of line and you need to be set back in your place. Who believes that? Say amen. amen. Including the preacher. It's why, Gary, I don't buy sermons online. I don't preach somebody else's messages. Before I can give it out, I have to take it. Who's ever had castor oil? Three people, four people, five people. You ever had, you ever swallowed castor oil? It used to be the medicine that my grandma gave my mom and all her brothers and sisters. Every Friday, 
they got a dose of castor oil to swallow. And that cleaned them out. And as slimy as that junk is, it doesn't surprise me. Everything just slides out then after that. You ever swallowed that? I'd rather swallow a live goldfish than swallow castor oil. But apparently it's good for you. And if I have to take the medicine and you have to take the medicine, then I have to take the medicine too. Amen? Turn to Luke chapter 13. I'll end here. I'm not done, but I'll end here. This is what Hezekiah did. Now again, I might preach a message next Sunday that follows up with this, some other things Hezekiah did. And there's a reason why God was doing all this. It's a neat story. You ought to go read it. But every now and then we need revival. So I'm not going to preach about what Antifa's doing and what Nancy Pelosi's up to and Hillary might run. And I'm not going to get into that for a while. I think maybe I need revival. I need to be reminded what the house of God is for. Amen. So Luke 13 verse 24. Strive to enter in at what kind of gate? It's a straight gate. Don't you believe you ought to keep your life straight? You ought, you ought to at least keep your lives straight. But keep your life straight. Nobody wants to be crooked. Crooked in their dealings. Crooked in their ways. So the gate that God has set before us is a straight gate and it's narrow. It's narrow. It's not one of these everybody goes in kind of gates. Only a few go in. And who opened that gate for you to go through it? God did. And if you get to that gate and find that it's been shut, then God shuts you out. There's another story, Matthew 25, of five wise virgins who had their lamps oiled, wicked, and ready to go. And when the bridegroom called, they left. While the foolish were out looking for oil, but then they came back and found that the door had been what? Shut. And they thought they were going to heaven. That's who those five are. They're not, we're not talking about the crowd that never thinks about church or goes to church. We're talking about people that go to church. They're five virgins, maidens, looking to be wed to the bridegroom. But because of their foolishness, God shut the door on them. Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. So why did God shut those five foolish virgins out? He didn't even know them. He said, I'm not marrying you. You're too ugly for me. You're too wicked. You're a Jezebel. Think I want to live with five of you for all of eternity? No, no, no. I want to live and dwell with those who love me. And see, this is at the core of the problem then. It's two commandments. You either love the Lord your God or you don't. And that's all there is to it. You either love your neighbor as yourself or you don't. And that's all there is to it. And then verse 26, then shall you begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in thy presence. We took communion on Sunday. That's what I think that means, or at least part of it. We took communion every Sunday. We did religious rituals in the house of God. Did you not see us there? We did it in your presence. That big 
Catholic statue they got hanging in all those churches. We did it in your presence, Jesus said. That wasn't me. That wasn't me. And it's taught, that's, that was taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Now what is to those whom God shuts the door? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. So you have to ask the question, which side of the door do you want to be on when that thing shuts? Because it's going to shut. You think this COVID thing, you think that's of God? You better believe it is. Better believe it. God's shutting people out. So you know what I saw? I, I saw an article this morning. I, I had some of these ideas pop in my head as soon as I got to the church this morning. Pulled up some articles. And one of them was saying, well, maybe now God is showing us that we, we're not to be gathered in a physical building, but we're to be connected by spirit. Now, they did not identify that spirit. And my suspicion always goes toward the evil side. Maybe we should be connected some other way. And that was written by a church. And I say, watch out. It's about what you want, what you ask God for while the door is open. Wait until after it's shut. That's going to be too late. Bow your head. I better quit. I just want to ask you this morning. You're not, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. This will be between you and God. God's your judge. I'm not. Don't want to be. But ask yourself the question. Where do I want to be on Sunday? What do I want to be doing in the afternoon when nothing's going on and the Holy Ghost tapping me to read my Bible and I find 15 other things all of a sudden that I'm doing now instead of reading my Bible? Why is it that I'm not praying like I used to pray? Where's my church attendance been? Maybe it's not too late. Maybe God hasn't shut the door on you yet. Maybe just God let you hear the creaking of the door and it scared you a little bit. By the way, Jesus himself is the door. If you want this, it's got to be through him. But I hope and pray that God hasn't shut the door on some of you yet. So I want you to pray. And I'm going to pray for you this morning. I'm going to pray with you.